is part three on a series on the so-called CIA Democrats, National Security Democrats, or veterans running for Congress, where we saw ten uh, uh, groomed and selected uh, national security veterans, some of them at very senior posts involving uh, CIA activities in Iraq, very senior people uh, uh, running for office. There were about 32 on the Democratic side, and they have a lot of common denominators in terms of their funding. Yet, <clears throat> their messaging isn't all uh, yet coordinated. We don't know exactly where these people stand. In part one, we contrasted these 10 CIA Democrats to the 10 progressive candidates. And I have all of this in a document that I will share with you. Uh, and that would be right here. This is a, a let's get to the exact matter here. Uh, we are talking about the Bernie Slate. It was elected, three of which were incumbents, and here are two Justice Democrats in addition uh, who are represent, uh, uh, endorsed by the Young Turks. And then we have the National Security Democrats, which I will sort by that uh, they won their races, and these are the ones who won their races, and they should be listed by their district, and uh, some of these are very senior people. This one here worked for uh, John Negroponte, I think is his name, who is a total out-and-out -out, uh, war criminal who helped uh, repress uh, indigenous and progressive movements throughout the Third World in the 1980s using death squads, assassination, invasion, embargo, mining of harbors, whatsoever. One thing is to look at what they say Another thing is to look at who is funding them. Uh, so this part is entitled, The CIA Democrats Follow the Money. Before I get to that, I want to give an example of the type of journalism that's being employed to cover this. In the U.S., military veterans are running for Congress this year in record numbers, many for the first time. Lisa Desjardins traveled to northern New Jersey to see how this national trend is playing out in one competitive House district. On Memorial Day, in northern New Jersey, retired First Sergeant Amory Vasso is leading the remembrance. Today, we are taking time to ensure the nation remembers the sacrifices of America's fallen. If I'm The event is a calm, profound statement of service and gratitude. Amory served 23 years in the Army, including in Desert Storm and Iraqi Freedom. He's also a voter who values veterans' principles. They swore an uh, oath to uphold and defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and all that. And they, I think they hold that still to this day, even if they're out. Amory lives in a closely watched, unique district, the open congressional seat in New Jersey's 11th. Among the crowded field are no fewer than four veterans, two in each party, all first-time candidates. Come on. What's up, boy? Amory is undecided, but gives one of the most often heard arguments in favor of electing veterans. They understand putting the country before themselves is important. I'm not sure that all of the representatives in Washington... This PBS piece uh, continues in its vein never once examining what are the downsides of filling our Congress uh, with military and intelligence officials. So the obvious downside of having soldiers in Congress, uh, military, is that uh, uh, this has tended to line up with fascism, with totalitarianism in some cases in the past. Um, obviously after an important war like World War II or uh, the Civil War or the Revolutionary War, there will be a tendency for veterans traditionally to go into office, get into breaking this group of so-called veterans, uh, meaning that some of these people are, are not merely veterans. They are senior officials in the military industrial system, but not so senior as any of them to have yet uh, become millionaires, although that will no doubt happen within a few years for the ones that did get elected. Soldiers are good at following orders. Uh, one uh, uh, soldier's 
uh, are not known for their creativity. Of course, there's uh, combat creativity, but it is not the number one characteristic of soldiers. Uh, so there could be downsides to filling Congress with soldiers and CIA agents, especially uh, considering the following factors. So uh, it's not a matter of attacking anyone for being an intelligence agent or a uh, member of the United States Armed Forces. It's a system that we have to analyze. And um, so what I would like to say is that if a country is consistently the number one spender on arms, as we are, the number one initiator of wars, which we have been certainly since the uh, uh, end of World War II, that country is driving an arms race. If you're the one tending to initiate wars, if you're the one tending to have the highest arms budget, which we have by far, the U.S. and its uh, uh, represents almost half of all world arms spending. When you c c add our allies in Europe and in Japan, uh, it's like 80% uh, of arms spending globally. Um, we are driving an arms race. Uh, uh, now, what did Republican President Dwight D. Eisenhower, the five-star Supreme Allied Commander of the Armed Forces, say about uh, driving up uh, arms spending. This is what he said about it. Every gun that is made, every warship launched, every rocket fired signifies in the final sense a theft from those who hunger and are not fed, those who are cold and not clothed. This wooden arms is not spending money alone, it's spending the sweat of its laborers, the genius of its scientists, the hopes of its children. The cost of one modern heavy bomber is this, a modern brick school in more than 30 cities. It is two electric power plants, each serving a town of 60,000 it is two fine, fully equipped hospitals and some 50 miles of concrete pavement. We pay for a single fighter plane with a half a million bushels of wheat. We pay for a single destroyer with new homes that could have housed more than 8,000 people. That is, I repeat, the best way of life to be found on the road the world has been taking. It's not a way of life at all in any true sense. Under the cloud of threatening war is humanity hanging from a cross of iron. Is there any other way the world may live? Question mark. Not only do we deprive our own citizenry with more than 15% of the U.S. population living in poverty, while our military overage, that is the amount we spend above and beyond, say, maintaining double the spending of China, or five times the spending of Russia, which would be around $400 billion a year, uh, versus the present close to trillion when you add the national security apparatus and the intelligence agencies. Um, uh, uh, this could easily wipe out all poverty in the U.S. if we simply brought it down uh, a couple of notches, <clears throat> significant notches, to drop to 400 billion. We're doing this to our allies because they tend to ratchet up their spending to keep up with us proportionately. We're uh, taking money away, uh, opportunity away from our adversaries, who were not our adversaries once and they won't be forever. So we aren't uh, hostile to the population of China or Russia. Uh, our governments have conflicts with each other. So no one here, unless we're in a hot war, should want to deny a Russian city of its teachers or a Chinese uh, a farm of its machinery because they have to deploy those resources into maintaining this arms race. The way this can be pulled off is to create this quasi-religious cult of worship of the military, which is outlined in the book by a guy named Thorsten Veblen called The Theory of the Leisure Class which is that we've always had a parasitic element on top of our societies, the warrior class. To this, we now add the, um, uh, the merchant chieftain, the billionaire. For me, if I was a serviceman, a, 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 an employee of the Department of Defense, I would take satisfaction in my work, uh, and I would not expect my neighbors to uh, thank me for my service. Uh, just as uh, if I work as an engineer, or a scientist, or a teacher, or a doctor, uh, we take satisfaction in our work. Now, for others to want to honor people and professions, that's fine. But we shouldn't seek out uh, ego gratification. There should be a sense of humility right now. When we look at the hard evidence, which is that since World War II, we have not properly declared war. Uh, on any of the actions we've been involved in. The Korean War and every war we have fought since has been immoral, so immoral, we did not have the stomach to declare war. The Congress has cravenly passed the buck, so when we celebrate Memorial Day and Emirates Day, should we not mourn also the death of our democracy when we do not even have 
the intestinal fortitude to uh, follow our own constitution and provide a proper declaration of war. So in the case of Iraq, for example, there was the uh, authorization of use of military force, a blank check given to Bush, and then Bush went off and started declaring war in countries that had al-Qaeda or associated forces in them. Now, it turns out there was no al-Qaeda link to I Iraq because Saddam Hussein had a secular government, a non-religious government, and uh, al-Qaeda was deeply hostile to the Ba'athist in uh, Baghdad. Uh, and uh, so it was, uh, we contravened our constitution by not declaring war, we cravenly passed on a carte blanche to the executive, uh, and, uh, and all of this, sh people should have a sense of humility about all of this uh, when they run puff pieces on uh, veterans uh, entering office. So, to disclose the results of my research, it's been very interesting following them up. Now, let's go in there and take a look. I believe it's right here. Um, so first of all, this is a list of all the contributions from big known donors to these national security candidates. So here we have Lauren Baer, who I believe lost. Her number one contributor in this list is, uh, and this is a partial list because we have their actual contributions listed here, uh, which I believe comes to a grand total of, do I have a total here? It would be nice, wouldn't it? Total the amount is $55 million we see here. Now a fair amount of that is going to come from the main house PAC, um, the Democratic Central Committee, and um, in the case of the Senate, the Senate PAC. However, about half of this money is traceable to these following big donors, which amount to, um, which are right here, which are amount to Twenty-eight million dollars out of fifty-five, so about half of the money is accountable to these political action committees. We have Alphabet. I happen to put them in here to, because it's interesting to study Google's intentions. Um, the With Honor Fund, which is uh, funded by Jeff Bezos, the House Majority PAC, which is uh, aligned with Nancy Pelosi, and is definitely. Uh, we'll go into that, but it's also the standard uh, Democratic contributors, George Soros, uh, this guy named Simmons, which is a whole other story, which we will talk about now. Simmons, so, so this is kind of complicated. Um, let's see if I can give you the information on Simmons. So here are the top 100 contributors in the U.S., These folks spent, what does it say, $637 million in this cycle. At the top, we've got Sheldon Adelson, who is a hardcore uh, right-winger supporting Netanyahu in Israel. Um, and um, then we've got Tom Steyer, who is a uh, climate change activist for the Democratic Party. Uh, then the Uline, fam uh, which is uh, a um, Republican conservative family. Uh, then we've got Michael Bloomberg, who uh, is the second largest contributor to the Democratic Party. Donald Sussman. Now, there's an interesting article, and I believe Sussman is pointed to here. Simmons is from Renaissance Technology. And Renaissance Technology, um, uh, there's more money than that here, really because uh, his partner is Mercer, and Mercer was the main backer for Trump. Um, so we've got Simmons funding uh, Democrats, and then his partner Mercer funding Trump. So then we've got, of course, George Soros. Then Blackstone is one of the biggest companies in the world. That's BlackRock. Blackstone is a big uh, private equity firm. Steve Schwartzman traditionally a conservative type. Then we have Jeff Bezos coming up here in position 11. This guy Griffin is a conservative. I'm not sure about Eichner, he might be a liberal. And another interesting fact we have to talk about is that roughly 50% of the contributions to the Democratic Party come from Jewish people. 
as reported by the Jerusalem Post, and 25% the Republicans. Um, and the question is, why is this so? And does this uh, create a conflict of interest with Israel? Policy in the Middle East has obviously been affected by the oil industry, to put it mildly, uh, the general conquer the world mentality of the American exceptionalist tradition, which is to gradually have all the world have uh, the ability to have Western banking, credit cards, McDonald's in them. And that if we have to, you know, we'll put pressure on them, we'll sanction them, we'll interfere in their domestic politics, we'll fund their adversaries, we'll discredit them, we'll spread rumors about them, we'll assassinate them, we'll lend them money and then put them into debt peonage, uh, and we'll do all these pressure tactics. It's the imperialists, basically, the neoconservative sort of marriage of, uh, they're like petro-imperialists. And then, and then you've got people that are like, uh, my country right or wrong about Israel. So um, what would you know be an unfair shot would be to say, I haven't heard Barbara Streisand say anything about Yemen, right? So we have these liberal Jewish activists but are we hearing their voices raised about Yemen, which Israel isn't really directly connected to? But nonetheless, it's part of this whole uh, Middle East coalition with Netanyahu is uh, aiding the Saudis with intelligence uh, for their war in Yemen. So when we look at the Forbes, um, Forbes 400 top billionaires in the United States, it'd be fun to add up their money too. Um, but if we look at them, um, and we look at their contributions. Well, at the top, you've got Jeff Bezos, but then after that, there are no significant contributions in this cycle until Sheldon Adels Adelson at number 15. Why are the... Oh, and Michael Bloomberg, obviously. I think I missed him. That should be 39 million, uh, roughly. So I haven't quite finished updating all of this yet. Um, but what we see here, and then we have uh, 12 million here, at position number, Steve Schwartz at number 34. Um, then uh, who's next on the list? Uh, Ken Griffin of Citadel, 11 million, conservative. Um, then we've got Charles Schwab, se uh, conservative, 7.2 million. Um, George Soros, 17 million at position 60, roughly. Um, but, uh, the, you know, I haven't filled in everyone, but the rest of these that didn't, were not the main uh, players in the election. So the question isn't why isn't there, uh, since we've removed all the restrictions on using money in politics, which happened with Citizens United, now I know why Bernie Sanders says that the billionaires call the tunes and that the disastrous Citizens United, because when you start chewing through the numbers and everything, it's astonishing. But what we see here is... You know, if you take these billionaires, these 400 billionaires, an average of 10 billion each, um, that's four trillion dollars. If they took 0.1 percent of their capital, um, that would be 40 billion dollars per election cycle. Um, so, if they just just put 0.1 percent of their capital in every two years, um, it would increase the cost of elections by tenfold. So, um, this has not yet happened. But unless we rein it in, that is what could happen. Um, so let's see here. Now, the interesting thing is that the ones that actually did contribute a lot are not even on the top 400. So you've got, um, no, uh, so Steyer, Tom Steyer, the Democratic climate change guy, is only worth 1.6 billion, so he's not on the list, uh, with 50 million. The Ulian couple, uh, which has Uline, this uh, shipping company, two billion is their value, so they don't make it on the list. They were 40 billion, uh, 40 million rather. Donald Sussman, uh, Fred Eichner, Timothy Mellon from the Mellon family, I believe, Reed Hoffman of LinkedIn. Uh, none of these people are even on the list. So uh, some of them are um, sort of B listers that are, uh, and uh, one, the case of Renaissance technology, uh, this guy. Uh, used long-term capital gains to pay uh, his taxes instead of uh, income, which is what would normally happen with the operation of trades millions of times and rotates the portfolio every quarter. So this guy could be on the hook for massive civil and criminal penalties as well as billions in taxes. 
So how that informs the Mercer and Simmons and their uh, their uh, donations, uh, uh, you can uh, imagine element of the money funding U.S. politics, which is to provide political coverage for themselves so that they won't be prosecuted. Now, on the other extreme, you have Trump proposing to give the Medal of Honor to Sheldon Adelson's wife, the largest campaign contributor he has, which is just unbelievable. So, you know, the most obvious thing about these CIA Democrats is, imagine if uh, the Democrats want to initiate some kind of conflict with Russia. On the one hand, you've got these people who understand the pain of sacrifice and all that, but on the other hand, many of them are probably cold warriors. These are senior people, they're not junior people in some cases. Secondly, what if they wanted to vote to impeach Trump? Which I'm not posing an opinion about myself, but if you have a bunch of soldiers um, and uh, they're cold warriors and you're basing your argument on uh, Russian interference which, in my opinion, is a interesting choice. See, nothing gets in the news for no reason. Everything has an agenda. Sometimes agenda is to get clicks because it's funny or salacious or outrageous. Um, but sometimes it's for a purpose. And obviously, uh, we could look at U.S. interference in uh, the uh, Germany with the wiretapping of Angela Merkel's phone or Obama coming out and publicly endorsing Macron. Uh, we could look at the fact that the U.S. has a substantial uh, election interference business through its covert agencies all over the world and overt uh, meddling where we invade countries uh, or in other ways uh, uh, get involved. But there was a choice made to focus on this where uh, also if you watch the movie The Israeli Lobby, uh, you'll see a real massive campaign of influence going on or when the U.S. flew an entire team to get a drunk elected in Russia in 1996 who proceeded to destroy the economy and the country, running the ground to the point where he was uh, crying when he uh, resigned and handed the government over to Putin. Um, but we chose to uh, focus on this, and for those of us who followed the Bernie Sanders campaign, we saw outrage after outrage. Right now we see these outrages happening with three disenfranchisers in chief, with Brian Kemp in Georgia, who took 350,000 people off the voting rolls using Chris Kobach's cross-check. You got Chris Kobach, and I believe he's in Ohio. And then you've got Scott Walker, who made it very difficult for students to vote in Wisconsin, definitely helped Trump win Wisconsin. Um, and so you've got three disenfranchisers in chief here, but. We saw these same tactics in the primary with Clinton, closing down of polling stations in Arizona, in Puerto Rico, deletion of 200,000 voters uh, in, uh, uh, in New York, uh, uh, exit polls not matching the votes, and that in, normally in a country we don't trust the voting of, if the exit polls deviate by more than three to 5% over uh, what the official vote count is, there's an assumption of fraud or a mistake. Um, so this did happen, and as a result, a weak candidate ended up facing off against Trump in this particular election. And as a result, we got Trump, which for some people is a major disaster. And, um, and, and the Clinton people uh, don't want to go out of business and go home. Uh, Pelosi does not want to resign and hand the reins over. Feinstein, after losing the endorsement of the Democratic Party in her mid-80s, decided that uh, she needed to uh, continue to block any progress here in California. Um, it seems that these people, once they've tasted power, just cannot let it go. We have uh, uh, Clinton get involved in saying that Stacey Abrams won the primary, and really um, Clinton is sort of radioactive for a lot of people, and she really should just uh, not comment on the Georgia election. My opinion is for her business. It's a free country, but I think she's actually should stay quiet until we get the runoff or not, uh, because I think she will just further polarize Georgia in an unhelpful manner. Why are only a few, maybe 10, of these 400 billionaires actually contributing more than 0.01% of their wealth? Uh, and the reason, in my opinion, is 
there's a couple of possibilities. One is there could be certain key guys that are the ones that are moving the money in. So the other guys don't take any political heat. So you don't want everyone having their company scrutinized by your political opposition um, by stepping in and funding when the funding isn't necessarily needed. Or uh, so one possibility is that there's a one guy, they draw straws and one rich guy says, I'll be the one who pays to bill this uh, for this dinner. Um, another possibility uh, is that uh, there are different ways of contributing. So if you are operating a news media outlet like Fox, like Rupert Murdoch, um, you don't need to, I, I don't know if Murdoch's got U.S. citizenship or not, but you don't need to give money. You just need to give uh, uh, propaganda with your uh, corporation. The ones that want to avoid scrutiny uh, are people that generally that would have uh, businesses that could be uh, taken apart or lose contracts if uh, you got too hot politically, you got too in the center of things. There's a potential for a vastly larger amount of money coming into elections. So let's look at one other important point here in the um, breakdown of funds. So the other important point in the breakdown of funds uh, yeah, let's see here. So here are the outside sources, uh, and then the, these are the um, the different people behind these outside sources. And so then, if we go in and look at how they lined up for uh, supporting these uh, Democrats, these CIA Democrats, we have the America First Action, which is Sheldon Adelson. So he spent seven million to defeat them. And this is Sheldon Adelson's specifically Trump PAC, because he put a hundred million into other guys. So seven million of that went to defeating these CAA Democrats. Um, so that's going to be interesting. Um, now then the next one is the House Majority Pact, PAC. Uh, and the House Majority PAC, uh, let's take a look here. The House Majority PAC is Pelosi, Simmons, Sussman, Unions, other large donors, um, because it's it's more regulated. Um, uh, well, it, it, it absorbs a lot more small uh, funds, so, uh, small donors. Some of these um, funds just have ten or twenty donors at all, are donating millions or hundreds of thousands each. And but this fund has a lot of uh, uh, mom and pop, you know, thousand bucks, ten thousand bucks. It's not really mom and pop. It's mom and pop corporations. Um, and wealthy individuals. Um, and then, of course, we did have about $250 million that went into the, uh, uh, well, be, uh, about $200 million that went in for the Democrats and donations under $200 each, and um, only $50 million for Republicans for donations of less than 200 each. So we see a lot less grassroots enthusiasm. And this is what I noticed about the Democratic Party when Ron, uh, Republican Party when Ron Paul was running is that a lot this whole party uh, became um, a part of the Ron Paul machinery until they changed the rules so it could never happen again uh, because uh, it seems to be somewhat hollow in some areas and that it is basically a corporate structure without a lot of citizen involvement. Uh, so getting back to who these folks are, so that's the House Majority Pact which is associated with Nancy Pelosi. Then we've got Independence USA, that's Michael Bloomberg. So. He is the second largest funder from these uh, from these lists. Then we've got uh, Tom Stairs, Climate Change Group, 500,000. Priorities USA, which is a Hillary Clinton group, which is giving almost nothing to this. I don't know because of their um, uh, because of their um, uh, not spending as much as cycle. I have to look at that more. And then Vote Vets is a Bloomberg group, and with honor is Jeff Bezos. Um, so that gives you an idea. We've got Bezos and Bloomberg, who aren't even really uh, Democrats, um, the principal uh, contributors to these campaigns outside of the traditional Democratic Party PACs. And we see a pattern where we have these B-listers who are contributing as much money as a few targeted billionaires. Um, and that's really uh, what I've got to report for you tonight. What you will. My name is Alexander Hagen. Good night and good luck.